Hello and welcome to Ur European Utility Week, uh, the event formerly known as Metering Europe. And I'm here in the Angerati studios, joined by Andreas Umbach, who is the president and CEO of Landis and Gear. And uh, Landis and Gear are one of the uh, top uh, smart metering uh, providers. And uh, we were talking earlier on, Andreas, welcome to the studio. Thank you. Um, about uh, some of the findings in the Angerati report that we've just put out and that one of the key issues facing this market and, and the adoption of this market is the regulatory framework and how that plays out to help the market uh, achieve what it needs to. What are your sort of, what's your take on that? Because you guys are clearly the, one of the market leaders in this. Yeah, well, yeah. I would even go one step beyond and say the market leader. But that's I'll leave that's it your job, <laughs> Andreas. <laughs> job. Yeah, for others to say that. Look, there's two a concept that come into mind with me which are almost a contradiction. Yeah. You require a free market to foster innovation. And I think this exhibition is a good example of what a competitive market can create. The number of players in this field and very good players in, in, in uh, high-tech technologies that are reliable and affordable it's just impressive. So you require a free market to develop that. Having said that, the application of our technologies, and specifically the smart meter, is with and by distribution utilities. These are regulated businesses. Uh, I use the ugly term monopolies. And a monopoly or a regulated business can only make an investment when it has a regulatory support. If you were to switch to a utility and that utility were to install a smart meter, which is not a cheap piece of equipment, actually the installation is the most expensive part of it, six weeks later you decide to switch to another utility and somebody has to rip off that investment, that's a financial nightmare. Nobody would invest in technology in such a scenario, which is why that asset, the meter, needs to be part of the regulated infrastructure. And that requires a regulator incentivizing utilities to make these investments. And what we're finding in Europe is that we have a beautiful European regulation supporting and mandated smart meters by 2020 or 2022. That's all perfect. What we're finding is that the execution, the regulatory execution, and the negotiations between the key utilities and the regulators in individual markets is being a little bit slow. And obviously the overall economic uh, situation does not help a, uh, a regulator right now make decisions that would facilitate large investment. So those are the two things. We need regulatory support to make sure that the investments are safe. If you want to put in a smart meter, you need to know that it's going to be working there and making money for the next 10, 15 years. Uh, it cannot be happen in a completely liberalized environment. So, so what are the, uh, I mean, what are the time scales? Because ov uh, obviously, there is a potential here that there are two different forces at play. There, uh, that there is me as the consumer in, in, in my home wanting choice, wanting to be able to go to different suppliers. There is the uh, uh, suppliers who, who have, and you're right, we can only look at, the, you know, look at uh, onto the show floor who have clearly adopted that we need to do this investment. No. Um, one side of the coin needs to know that it's going to pan out for 5, 10, uh, 15 years. The other part of me wants to go, well, if, I, if, I, if someone offers me something cheaper, uh, I mean, is there an argument that there needs to be another way of, of, of creating that framework to allow the consumer flexibility as well as safeguard the utilities? The consumer has the flexibility today in most European markets. He can choose his retail uh, utility. He can switch from one to the other. So he's got the choice. The problem is that the utilities can offer very little functionality. They can offer electric services, kilowatt hours, and very little around it. Mm. It requires a smart media infrastructure uh, to allow for more functionality. And the way we're always recommending it, not only as Landis and Gear, but in my times where I was the president of ESMIC, European Smart Media Industry Group, was to make sure that the asset, the hardware, is protected and regulated. However, that the market has access to the data, or that the consumer defines who has access to the, to the data. A utility, your distribution utility, will install a smart meter in your home. You as the consumer decide whether only the consumption data will be accessible to one uh, utility you b that should invoice you or whether you, would under, well, you want to have other service providers have access to the data so that they can offer additional services to you. So, so are you going to see a, a point where, uh, uh, I mean, it's one of the arguments that, uh, that I make is that utilities are going to uh, suddenly have to become more like service providers. It's, it's a bit like the, the telecom infrastructure world where 
uh, you know, th there was a race to the bottom in terms of delivering broadband to the home. Yeah. Uh, and then everybody suddenly realized, well, actually, we, we've got that connection. What else can we layer over the top of that so that we can retain our margins and make the c customers stickier and, uh, and things like that? I is that what you're talking about in terms of this, this ecosystem that services can be pushed down? Absolutely. The comparison is very legitimate and very, very good. However, the dimensions and the dynamics and the speed cannot be compared. Mm. Uh, through offering broadband to the end consumer, you create a need and you open new doors for, for things to consume, uh, we have to be very sober. We're talking about an electric electricity provision. You're not going to be riding your electric infrastructure the way you're riding your broadband. There's no YouTube and things like that. So we're going to be offering services to our customers where we cannot compare them to telecom space. It's about managing his energy. He can maybe uh, adopt demand response programs, things like that. Uh, he signs up for it, then he wants to forget about it. He wants that technology to work in the background. Mm, we have to be very realistic. I'm not going to wake up in the morning looking at my electric consumption and go to bed looking at it. I want to look at it once a quarter and know that I've signed up for a program will automate that for me. So there are parallels in terms of what the industry can do for the end consumer, but I think the rating of the benefits uh, is just not comparable. Uh, telco is a lot of fun. Yes. Uh, energy, yeah. uh, I love it, but I have to admit most people find it quite boring. Yeah, and uh, and you got a you 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 guys are planning what five ten years that 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 that, that sort of time scale. And I suppose the other thing that gets involved is 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 politics. I mean, you know, I, I live in the UK, so you know, you you you're already starting to see a dynamic where, look, you know, and this is just to make a point. I, uh, you know, uh, we, we've bailed out the banks, so uh, now do we need to put money into d delivering this whole grid infrastructure? And then who's going to own it? And uh, you know, when you've gone so far down a deregulated approach, how I suppose the question I'm asking, how does Europe deal with this issue? Because we've read reports where if we're not careful, country, countries like China and Japan, who are leading uh, a march on this, will be setting the standards and Europe will just end up with this fragmented, bitty place and will never get this energy efficiency we're looking for. Well, you've touched on two things. First, let me let me mention the UK. I mean, you you live or you you are part of the most one of the most dynamic electricity markets or energy markets in in Europe. And I think the uh, UK is a role model when it comes to competitiveness and liberalisation. Uh, they got a few details slightly wrong. Uh, for example, the UK is a market where the retail uh, utility owns the meter, and that's been a big hindrance to investments. Uh, we have several years of delays because of that. Now they find a way to organise themselves, and you will find um, energy or retail utilities like British Gas making large investments in in smart metering. So I love the British market for that sense. There have been some delays, but investing quite happily. Uh, when it comes to Europe, we just have to be aware that, yes, the uh, big picture, Europe is one market, but the entire electric infrastructure is different, market to market. There's interconnections. I think it's quite advanced. Uh, the way it's working, a regulatory framework at high level, Europe, it's all it needs. I don't want the European uh, regulators in getting into details. And then we need the local execution. So I see more of the bottleneck in the regulatory agencies in specific countries. I don't think that we're behind or disadvantaged over Japan or, or China. China obviously is huge, and when they make a decision and roll it out, it's impressive. Mm. I, I think if you look at modern ways of generating electricity, news infrastructure, I don't think Europe has anything to hide behind. I think if any, uh, anybody were to ask me for an assessment, if anything, the way we're going and with investments in renewables, we're likely to be the center of uh, very competitive technologies in a benchmark uh, across the world. So I feel very bullish about the situation mm. in Europe. And, and that aspect of, uh, of renewal, uh, renewables, d do you think we fundamentally need a smart grid network to make the renewable economics work? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, the economics, well, it's, you don't need the yeah, economics. Yeah. If you wanna, if certain governments like in Germany decide to pull out of nuclear, and I don't wanna comment whether that's the right thing or, or a bad thing to do, it's a decision and they're investing heavily into solar and wind. Every child knows that you can't control wind, you can't control the weather. And we've seen some crazy things happening in recent weeks. I think a few weeks ago, the Germans broke a record. They produced all well, 30 gigawatt hours, uh, uh, gigawatts of, of solar electricity. Uh, if I understand this correctly, I think eight nuclear power plants had to make an emergency, emergency shutdown in France. 
there's no way you can leave that regularly by itself. You're going to have to make investments across the grid to automate that at all levels. Mm -hmm. You need it at the high voltage level. You also are going to have to make investments to manage all of the centralized energy generation in the, what we call microgrids. Mm -hmm. uh, so you manage and try to trigger uh, demand when the mm -hmm. supply is there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a big, big requirement for investment there. And uh, I mean, this is uh, one other thing we, uh, we touched on. I think we're slowly coming to the uh, uh, end of our time. But in, in that dynamic adjustment of, uh, 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 of the smart grid with the amount of data that is being thrown out and the, the need to have interconnectedness uh, of things, the Internet of Things, uh, but do you think there is another area where uh, we aren't quite there yet, which is about having the systems that can analyze this mass quantity of data in such an agile way to make the adjustments almost in real time or near to real time? Do, do you see that as a bottleneck or is that being hyped as a bottleneck? No, it's being hyped as a bottleneck because people are assuming there's going to be one super center in Europe managing all of it and that's nonsense you're going to have a tremendous amount of data centers decentralized. You need to manage all of what I'm describing. In managing of renewables, you need to do on the microgrid, in the low voltage area, and in the neighborhood if you want. Uh, the attempt to manage that centrally in one country or across countries is ridiculous, impossible to do. So it's like uh, introducing, tra imagine Europe didn't have any traffic lights and you decided to roll out traffic lights, you wouldn't manage those centrally. You would manage them within the neighborhood where those traffic lights are operating and yeah. at maximum within the city. Uh, if I have a, a, a small area with too much photovoltaic supply in southern Spain, it's irrelevant for Hamburg and Germany. So let's manage it down there. So I see a beautiful uh, development of the new technologies, but it's going to be extremely decentralized with a few things uh, centralized at the high level, which is big transmission across Europe. And innovation on the edges. Exactly. Okay. Thank you very much for making the time uh, to be with us today. Uh, there will be more from uh, the Angerati studio as the event goes on. Uh, I will let uh, uh, Andreas have the, uh, have the last word. I mean, uh, uh, in walking around the show uh, uh, out there, uh, is there anything new? Is there anything that, uh, that, that grabs you? Well, uh, I, I, obviously, I, I know which company has the best uh, booth, but I'm not going to repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> No, there's a tremendous, I think uh, this is also hopefully very attractive to our customers. It shows you that this is not about whether the technology exists, whether there are enough suppliers, and whether these things are reliable. It's about how can we get together to execute it. There's some massive need for investments to manage particularly uh, renewables, and that's something we've been coming with our customers, and I'm very excited about the prospects of that. Andres, thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Good. Good.